Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to The Shelly Roy Show. I am your host, Shelly Roy, and we have a great show for you guys tonight. I pray you guys are continuing to stay safe and sanitized. I pray you guys are having a great week so far. So before I start the show, I always like to start off with thanking our sponsors. The Shelly Roy Show is sponsored by Built on Survival Skills Apparel. We're also sponsored by Liquid Lipo, where you could lose up to a pound a day. For tips on how to become a boss, be sure to check out ShellyBossUp.com. I also want to thank my photographer, Steven Tucker, my makeup artist, Amber Singletary, and last but not least, Savvy Transportation. You guys stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Grab your family. You guys make sure you tune into Facebook. Get your questions ready because up next I have attorney Ryan Jones. Stay tuned after the break. Do you or anyone you know have a business or a brand you want to promote? Would you like to be a guest or be a part of our studio audience? If so, contact us at theshellyroyshow at gmail.com or contact us on Instagram at theshellyroyshow. Can't wait to hear from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, guys, to The Shelly Roy Show. I am your host, Shelly Roy. And joining me is attorney, also candidate, attorney general for District of Columbia. Help me welcome Mr. Ryan Jones. <laughs> welcome, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, really welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It's truly an honor for sure. Of course. Truly an honor. So we have so much to talk about. Yes. So before we get into your campaign and all the wonderful things that you're going to be doing and all the things that you're going to be fighting for for the D.C. residents. Tell everybody who Ryan Jones is and what's your story. I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C. Yeah. You know, you go through the uh, you go through the learning lessons of growing up in Washington, D.C. You go to school, you get mm -hmm. a wonderful education and you have to do something with it. Absolutely. And that's where I am now. That's great. Um, wanting to make sure that I can positively impact a community, society, uh, to do good work with what I've attained over the, the 37 years of my life. And I know you'll do a great job with that. And later on, we're gonna walk through some of the things that you're gonna be fighting for. And then we're gonna do some Q&A later. Okay. So you mentioned that you grew up in DC. Where did yes. you grow up in DC and what school did you go to? So I grew up in Northwest. Um, 14th Street, between 14th and 16th. Okay. Um, Cardoza area? Further north. So okay. Theodore Roosevelt, ah. West Elementary. You gotcha. Throw, look out the back door and throw a rock and hit west for my, my parents' house. Gotcha. Um, I ended up going to John Eaton for elementary school. Okay. Holy Trinity for middle school. Nice. To Matha for two years before transferring and graduating from St. John's College High School. Nice. On Military Road. Athletic. I yes. Hear. So yeah. yeah, I played played basketball in high school and in college. Absolutely. That's a great school for athletics too. So DeMath and St. John's. They're, Absolutely. They're, they're some of the best in the country. I agree. I agree. Um, so before we get into 
I also saw that you actually studied law at George Washington University right. as well. So I uh, graduated from Southern Illinois School of Law in two mm -hmm. and a half years with my JD. And nice. then, you know, took some time, reconsidered things and got my LLM and intellectual property okay. from GW. So for those of us who aren't mm -hmm. inclined with the law attorney language, what mm -hmm. does the LLM mean? The LL period M is like a Latin phrase for legum, legal, ah. legal masters. So gotcha. uh, that's the LL represents that legum in Latin. And so it's JD, the LLM is, you know, gives you some sort of specialty in the law. Gotcha. Okay. That's great. Great mm -hmm. accolade. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I see, based on the research that I've done, that you're no stranger to public service. Okay. Um, I also read that um, your mom is a real estate, she's in real estate, yes. who within her tenure in the real estate, she's allowed folks to have access to um, homes from real estate. And I also read that your dad um, did some work in the D.C. Council for some time as well. So my father worked for the Office of the People's Council, gotcha. which is uh, they help residents of Washington, D.C. Have, have an advocate when they're fighting their rates for, you know, utility bills. If utility, okay. You know, water is too high, gas is too high, or they're right. not getting the access that they should to those utilities. His office would step in on behalf of that resident and advocate for them before this public service commission in Washington, D.C. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you being exposed to the service and knowing what it's like to be of service within yourself, what was that like watching your dad? Seeing my parents, uh, you know, watching them interact, mm -hmm. seeing them get up every day, go to work. They had different schedules. As a real estate agent, my mom, sure. you know, her days would start later. And, and end later mm -hmm. and weekends my dad you know nine to five up early you know hitting it if he was you know driving or taking the bus down uh downtown from our neighborhood mm -hmm. and you know spending the day uh you, you understand that's what you do you get up and you Absolutely. put in hard work yeah. or it just seemed like it's just what you do right so it, it was something that i guess learned uh, just by seeing so it was a great environment which put me in a place where i was able to see other people thriving and doing good things i thought to myself okay well this is what you do so this is you know a possible thing for me right um, as a professional mm -hmm. or even seeing beyond what they were able to do for me mm -hmm. so no, but that's great motivation mm -hmm. for sure. So with that being said, you know, being able to have that positive influence and that motivation from your parents, understanding now you have a law practice. You're yes. the founder and principal of Ryan Jones Law. Yes. You practice litigation law, right? So some of which. Right. Yeah. So being a sole practitioner, mm -hmm. you take on a lot of different work and it's been a process of learning from day one mm -hmm. to the point where I am now, where I think I am, uh, have a great control over the work that I do. I've seen transactional work. So if you're getting into a partnership with another company, mm -hmm. I would review those documents or draft those documents. Okay. And teaming agreements and the amount of work that will come across my plate continued to grow. Mm -hmm. And then getting into the courtroom, representing people who you know, were my friends really who needed help, who said, hey, look, I don't know an attorney that I can turn to. You're the only person I know that then put me in the courtroom. And the work that I did for them got me as far as the Court of Appeals. And I've seen, you know, the Federal District Court and I've seen the Office of Administrative Hearings, which is a local D.C. agency. Mm -hmm. But these are all um, matters that or courtrooms that I was able to go into and experience all types of matters. So my experience has grown and I'm grateful for the clients that I've had mm -hmm. and the work that I did for one got me another one. Absolutely. And over the last seven, eight years, it's been a very enriching experience. And, and you know, now it's uh, me saying I want to do more, mm -hmm. right? 
No, that's really good. And thank you for expounding on that, because I was going to ask you for those of us who weren't really familiar with the litigation piece of it to give examples of the types of cases that you've handled. So thank you for clarifying that. That really is helpful. Of course. Very yes. helpful. Um, so growing up as a kid, what was that like? Because what I'm thinking now is with everything that you've done with litigation law and all of the different clients that you've had and the levels in which you've climbed throughout your tenure, mm -hmm. when did you realize that you wanted to become a lawyer? Uh, so growing up, you know, in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of lawyers on my block. Oh, wow. I had okay. uh, two of my, there's like three. There are three lawyers. That's with, great inspiration. Right. So there's a lawyer on the corner, they had a next door neighbor, and then down that alley, uh, they were on 16th Street, there was a lawyer there. He was uh, Garland Pinkston. He actually was the clerk of the Court of Appeals okay. in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was my childhood and, coach. Okay. Right. Childhood coach, uh, you know, little league basketball, and that type of it's like, okay, you can be an attorney. That's Absolutely. what you do. You know, it's like, oh, it's not something that seemed like a, a foreign concept. Yeah, which is good. Right. It's, it's great to grow up in those type of environments where it's within reach, where you can have those mentors and those inspirations. Absolutely. Which is really good. Um, what else is it? Um, so I know your parents are proud of you. I so, think so. <laughs> um, I know they are. So when you decided to become an attorney, what was your parents' feelings behind that? So, you know, uh, I was about 24 years old mm -hmm. trying to put down the basketball and figure out what my next step in life is going to be. What type of work I'm going to do mm -hmm. to, you know, take care of myself. Sure. And so my dad was thinking you can go get a master's, go get a doctorate and just be, you know, a research guy, be, you know, whatever that would entail going after a PhD. Mm -hmm. My mother stepped in and said, hey, look, this is what you want to do, um, guiding me more towards business school or law school. And that, and, and what would make sense for what I was doing to right. that point? Like, mm -hmm. do you want to represent athletes? What do you really want to do when you are an attorney? What are you going to do with your law degree? Good point. Um, what skill sets do you already have that would match what you've experienced with what you can have as an experience as an attorney. So if you're an athlete already, go get your law degree. You could be an agent. You could be in the front office of a, of a sports franchise as their general counsel or uh, legal counsel, and you'll have a, a touch and a feel for the sport. Mm -hmm. No, right? that makes sense, for sure. So that's kind of what got me into law school, but going through law school, your mind changes. You see so much more. Of course, more, yeah. Right? Of course. So with the sports agent piece of it, do you feel like you lean more to one type of case than the other, or what do you feel your strong suits are? Uh, so the interesting thing is what you learn being a sports agent or uh, being an entertainment attorney, you're really doing regular legal work just for people in the entertainment industry. Mm, so the sense. best thing you can do is be incredibly uh, educated and savvy and skilled in all walks of the law. Absolutely. So there's employment issues, there's contract matters. It's not different for entertainers than it is for the everyday person. It's the same law, the same statutes, the same case law. You got to know it. And Absolutely. You're saying, based on my who I am and the relationships that I have with people, mm -hmm. I'm going to be in the entertainment space. Versus, well, you know, you have to be very, uh, you know, experienced and have great relationships to really succeed in that space. And, you know, the truth is, there's more opportunity uh, to succeed and have a thriving business mm -hmm. when you open up yourself to more of the market. And that's the everyday person that has a nine to five and mm -hmm. then the everyday person that runs a business and are trying to open up an LLC, an entrepreneur. Um, so that's kind of where my path kind of diverged. So another person that I've bumped into, my mother's uh, co-worker mm -hmm. had a husband who was in intellectual property, who was uh, an international trade attorney. 
Ah, okay. So my very first year in law school this summer, I went to his law firm. And when I was at his law firm, I was able to see so much more. So many different things, yeah. Right, so there's, I'm gonna I'm go and break down just what it is. Right, but no, I think a, you hit on the key. The more you educate yourself and the more you're familiar with the different laws in every aspect of what it is you're doing, then it helps you to further where you're going. So I think you hit that on point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with that experience, I knew, okay, wow, you read the statutes, you read the case law, and here are the potential clients you can have because they're going to need you. So they were representing people like Apple and Microsoft and Samsung mm. and the type of billables that they were doing and the type of uh, courts that they were in. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that existed. And because of that, it opened up my world. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of kind of how I got the direction to go into intellectual property, you know, copyrights, trademarks. Mm -hmm. I don't do the patent stuff, but you understand how critical it is. When I look around your studio, how it's set up, you know, this is your trade dress. Yeah. So no one else can set their studio up like this. That's true. Right? So this is unique to you. Anyone else who tries to. Very unique. You got to protect yourself, right? I agree. I agree. So no, that's key. And basically the continuing education mm -hmm. is what I'm basically getting from everything that you just said, which is very important. Right. That's key. Um, and I did read that you did do the trademark piece of it as well. Right. So um, I was fascinated with the aspect, you know, trademarks are all around us. Mm -hmm. You know, you could pick up a can of soda as a trademark. You're picking up a clothing item. They're in your, it's in your tag. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we realize the importance of protecting your property in the stream of commerce. It's very important. Right. It's yours. And... If it's something that's unique and that you've designed and you've put your hard work and effort into, it should be protected. I and agree. And when you understand that there are lawyers and there's laws for that and understand how it works, you got to go file applications and you got to It's file. not an easy process. It's not. I've, I've gone through it. It's, it's not easy <laughs> and it, it can be very confusing so, at times. <laughs> so I was happy to do that kind of work. Yeah. You know, so uh, that's how I got into that, that, that area of the law. No, that makes sense. And that's a great point. So we're going to go to a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs> Do you or anyone you know have a business or a brand you want to promote? Would you like to be a guest or be a part of our studio audience? If so, contact us at theshellyroyshow at gmail.com or contact us on Instagram at theshellyroyshow. Can't wait to hear from you guys. <laughs> Thank you guys. I am back here with attorney, candidate for attorney general for District of Columbia, Mr. Ryan Jones. Welcome back, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so we're talking about the trademark and the patent and all that and how confusing that can be. Um, it's, it's necessary, but it's very confusing. Um, so let's really talk about the whole purpose of this interview is your campaign and your fight for the D.C. residents. So tell all the residents of D.C. why you're running for attorney general of the District of Columbia. Uh, 
It's simple. Uh, we live through 2020. You recognize that there's a great opportunity to uh, impact life and make it better going forward. Mm -hmm. We watched what happened, and there were people who lost their lives. We watched people protest. We watched people uh, march. Yeah. And I said, okay, my protest, my ability to get into good trouble mm -hmm. is going to be me running. I right. want to advocate for the people of Washington, D.C. And in my experiences in the courtrooms representing folks, I recognize that there needs to be a voice that gives the people of D.C. Uh, the voice that they need to be uh, advocating for them. That's great. And we definitely need someone with a voice. And we also want to have our voices heard, too. So now we're going to get more into walking through some of the things that you're going to fight for for the D.C. residents. Okay. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, protecting the D.C. residents, the businesses, and housing. Okay. So in my experiences in landlord-tenant, mm -hmm. uh, watching the laws that are being put into place now that allow for uh, fair housing, we need mm. to ensure that people are able to stay in D.C., Yes. have the opportunity to thrive in D.C. And mm -hmm. housing shouldn't be what pushes you out. Absolutely. They're unattainable. Yeah. Right. And we're at a time now where the courts are backlogged with, you know, issues of rent and asking people to leave only to be filled by who? Yeah. Right. We need people to have jobs to pay for their rent and pay for the utilities and, and making sure that we're just not pushing people out because people do just need the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so that's kind of uh, assessing where individuals are. And that's a their, great assessment. That's, that's among top of the priorities. I'm sure there's several priorities, but that's a huge one. Yes, especially with 2020 where mm -hmm. people couldn't work and then you needed to stay inside. Mm -hmm. You needed to be in a good place uh, where your homes were... Uh, our good homes with a, a solid roof, mm -hmm. you know, clean water. These things are important, especially when you're fighting through an airborne virus. Absolutely, and yeah. Going forward from here, we know just how important it is to have solid living conditions with access to uh, Wi-Fi and internet. The little things, yeah. Right, those things that a lot of people may take for granted, mm -hmm. others don't have access to because that's how children are educated. Well, that's through, true. through 2020, that's how yeah, they were the educated, hybrid. Mm -hmm. right? So if you don't have quality connection, you're going to miss out on critical lessons from your teachers. Mm -hmm. And then is there going to be a larger gap between people who did have access and those who didn't? Right. And then what are you blaming uh, when a child can't thrive? Are you blaming that's true. Them? What are you blaming their access to resources, really? Yeah. And so as an attorney general, you know, you're hoping to put kids in a place to where they're not That's getting not pushed out to the margins, mm -hmm. that they're included and finding unique ways to do it. Mm -hmm. No, that's great stuff. A great point. Um, talk to me a little bit about promoting equity for lower income and mar minority residents. Yeah, so um, my experiences, I've seen the way laws, the way that they're enacted and then the way they're enforced mm -hmm. are going to, they, they have a desperate impact, right? They impact certain residents more harshly than, than others. others. Mm -hmm. And for example, you have laws that are going to impact, uh, are going to impact people who look a certain way because, mm -hmm. and where they are situated financially. Right. And so those laws need to come off the books. I agree. As they have the desperate impact. And some laws just are flat out unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And that's how you promote equity, right? So if you're a contractor and you're unlicensed because you're just trying to get off the ground and start a business and make some money, you shouldn't be able to be sued because you're unlicensed as a contractor. That's true. Right? And yeah. that's what laws on the books say. If you don't have a license, you're paid before you finish your job, you have to that's return true. all that money. Mm -hmm. And people are going after folks for that. And, you know, when you think about it, that person's really trying to get off the ground. Yeah. And a law like that, that keeps That happens them, a lot, too. Right. Mm -hmm. that, a law like that keeps them down. That should be a fine. It shouldn't be, 
you have to return all the money. Or the fine should be, you know, go get a license. Right. And get into the stream of business and governance that you're taxed and that your business is acknowledged and you can go and get insurance. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the way you create equity. You're now in the in, in the center of commerce and business and governance and you're not, you know, moving and operating on the margins without an opportunity to really be a part of. Uh, Move forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so those there's other laws such as that. OK. That you take those off the books and replace them or t tinker with Tweak them a them. bit. Right. Mm -hmm. They get to the goal of equity so that all residents can enjoy, you know, having a home, mm -hmm. having clean water, having access to resources so then their children have a better upbringing, access to education. And those are the reasons, you know, those are kind of the things that. Uh, no, that's great. No, that's exactly what we need. That's paramount, <laughs> really. Um, talk to me a little bit about improving DC's judicial system for misdemeanors in the diversion programs. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, that's a good one. So the Office of Attorney General in Washington, D.C. splits its jurisdiction with the U.S. Attorney's Office. That's the federal mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. But the OAG's office has adult misdemeanors, juvenile offenses, and those type of crimes don't put you, shouldn't put people in a system which grinds them down and then they're in a worse condition Keeps on the out. other side, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So most people are committing crimes out of need, out of necessity, mm. to just get food, you know, to just survive. And you got to assess those type of crimes and see, look, if you had a mentor, if you had a job. That would be nice. Would you be doing that? And do we really need to be spending money to put you in jail or put you into a system versus spending money to get you an opportunity? Right. Because oftentimes when that happens, it creates a trickle down effect. Right. Even with the misdemeanor, certain jobs, depending on right. what type of job it is, you're unable to secure that job. That's right. So that's a great point. Um, talk to me a little bit about making communities safe, especially with the gun violence that we've been having that's been plaguing our communities. Yeah, I think it's a problem that we haven't been able to solve. Mm with what it's we've done, need. right? Yeah. It's, some may think it's even getting worse. So what do we really need to do? It's a cultural evaluation. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, me as a person, I want everybody to go home safely. I want you to keep your life. And what are we turning to that creates this idea that being violent is okay? Um, yeah, it's not okay, Right. For sure. You know, loved ones get hurt, loved ones are lost, and then then it perpetuates a cycle. Somehow we have to break the structure that's allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. And we can do that with certain laws. We can do that with certain policies. And it's going to take some different thinking than what's already been in place. Mm. Because, you know, what do they say? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting it a different... creates habit, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's insane if you think that you're going to keep doing the same thing, you're going to create a different result. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be ingenuity um, and finding ways to have young folks value life. Know what, what, what's cool uh, is something other than a gun. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there like the Trigger Project and No Slide Zone that mm -hmm. are into prevention. And look, it's going to take some radical thinking mm -hmm. and a lot of good people to join in if we really want to see an improvement. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to bring these good people to the table, exercise some of these uh, unique ideas mm -hmm. because what we've done so far just isn't working. And that's no, that's no slight to the people who are just trying their best. Right. It's like, well, let's, let's try something better. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree. You definitely have to partner with different agencies and you also have to have the different mentorships. And I believe with that, it also starts at home, too. Right. Not only just with the programs that you're trying to implement, but it also starts at home. Right. As well. So 
Um, do we have time for to begin the Q&A? We can start the Q&A. I think we have some. Welcome back, guys, to the Shelly Roy Show. We are now going to start the Q&A session of the campaign. Do we have a question? Uh, Ryan, why do you want to be the Attorney General for D.C.? Um, you recognize the amount of impact you can have on a city, and this is a city that I'm from. This is my hometown. And so in this role, I know that with my skill set, being, being in the courtrooms, being in, uh, aware of the law and how legislation works and the role that Attorney General plays, I think this was my way of giving back, wanting to help others, help the city that I know can be better than it is. Uh, this is. This is the way I can do it. Ryan, how do you handle stress and pressure? Uh, meditate, pray. Uh, there's a higher power out there that says, you know, Absolutely. everything that's on your plate, you know, that's for you. You know, you, if it's there, you can handle it. So uh, he doesn't give us any more than we can bear. Amen. Great answer for sure. Next question. Hello, Ryan. How are you? Hi, how are you? Describe a difficult project and how you overcome it. Uh, look, I think you take things in uh, one bite at a time. There's some weird saying. It's like, how do you eat something one bite at a time? So a difficult project, look, you need to get started early and work through it at a, a good pace. Mm -hmm. And you'll eventually accomplish the goal of completing it. Great answer. Uh, tell us about an accomplishment that you are super proud of. All right, I'm going to keep it legally <laughs> focused. You know, a friend of mine was facing a very, very difficult time in his life, and he needed an attorney. Mm -hmm. He came to me. He was facing uh, 10 years. Wow. Uh, for mistake. And, you know, look. Was it a misdemeanor? Or it was, was a, a felony. Mistake? Okay. And it was a it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was some misconduct on the other side mm -hmm. where it shouldn't have been revealed. Got but it. Uh, look, we went in there, we argued our case, and at the end of the day, he was able to go home, and he's not a felon. You know, he's able to continue to keep his job oh, that's and great. keep working and. You know, you see him now, and he's like, man, with a second lease on, on life Amen. after that uh, instance. So that's the most 
proud I've been of all the work that I've done was being able to stand up for a friend that I've known for years. And to give him his life back, a second right, chance, and right. clear his name. Right. Absolutely. So uh, that's that's the, the walking out of that courtroom that day. <laughs> Shoulders up, <laughs> right. for sure. Yeah. Well uh, deserved. Yeah, that was one. It was like you felt that pressure. Like mm -hmm. if he Big was going in there, off. I was going in there. Ah, uh, yeah. Know? So that's not the way it should be as an attorney, but that's the way I treat it in order to be successful. Understand. I treat it like it's my own. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Next question. Hi, Ryan. So I have it's a two-part question. Okay. My, my first question is, um, define attorney general. Mm -hmm. And number two, why should we pick you? <laughs> uh... The attorney general in Washington, D.C. is the mayor's, you know, counsel, the council's lawyer. And uh, they're the number one guy, the number one attorney in D.C. government. Mm -hmm. And all of what's possible and the responsibility that that position has, I'm saying that the person that I am, the qualities that I have, the skills that I have, uh, I'm the best suited from this point forward to ensure that we have an equitable future for all of our residents and those who are yet to get here. So there's a generation that's coming and mm -hmm. I want to look out for them. And I, uh, that's my perspective. And there was a second part, right? Or did he? That was, yeah, yeah, I got both of them. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> get me straight. <laughs> Next Ryan, question. so I have a question. Um, you know, what, what separates you from any other candidate? Literally. I mean, we hear a lot of promises here in the city. Um, what would make us follow behind your lead? Uh, so since uh, my, re my campaign uh, release day, you know, mm -hmm. April 26th, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people. And... One thing that stuck with me in the conversations with people, asking them to support me, asking them to give me money, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you come to me, you're going to ask me for this. Don't lose sight of mm. what it is that okay. I would want to see, right, what I'm asking for. And now you start to grow into the actual responsibility that you ha you're, you're asking for. Mm -hmm. It's not some dream that I just want to be considered DC's top attorney. No, no, no. It's look out for me, right? It's mm -hmm. get me access to justice. Yeah. Get me, keep me from having to have problems. Mm -hmm. Do what and you say you're going to do. Do what you basically. say you're going to do, mm -hmm. right? Own up to all of your promises. Mm -hmm. Keep them. Right. So that you can sleep at night so that mm -hmm. you know that the work that you've done will be of uh, the quality that people can look up to and aspire to, because I won't do it forever. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to have to pass the baton Absolutely. if I'm in that role. Yeah. And you want to pass it to somebody and giving them a great opportunity to succeed on the other side. And you don't want them fixing a bunch of your problems. Right. No, that's true. That's the worst way. Next question. Um, tell me about, like, if you ever feel like you've ever been overloaded with work, um, and how did you handle that situation? And if, if you haven't had that situation, how, how will you handle it, you know, going into this new office? Uh, look, you just, you just, you can delegate, right? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta look and say, hey, look, I've got too much, and if I have too much, I need to share responsibilities with other people. Mm -hmm. Being a manager, being, uh, you, you have to figure out where the work should go. Um, you know, and I imagine you're saying, if I feel overloaded, it's still the work that I have to do. Even mm -hmm. if it's managing the delegation, you take, a, you take peace and solace mm -hmm. and sort through it, and you figure it out. That's just what the, that's just what you do as a person. Every mm -hmm. that situation you've gotten in, you've survived it, mm -hmm. right? And but so, that's a part of being in a leadership role, though. Right. Delegating. I mean, even though everything falls on your shoulder and it's really primarily all of your tasks, that's the part of 
being in a leadership role, being able to delegate and then also understanding the strengths and the skills of the people that you're delegating to. That's right. You got to surround yourself with really good people. Yeah. So that you'll never feel really overwhelmed. Right. Good point. Next question. So, Ryan, um, being, being, I'm going to be completely transparent. I'm not an advocate. I'm not an advocate for police, for the judicial system, right? I'm a law-abiding citizen. I've been arrested and been to prison, had to fight for my life, for trial, for something I didn't commit. Mm. It was a lot of evidence that was, it was proven that I didn't do anything. But the, the judge, right, I had people writing letters, high-ranking people. I mean, I lost my whole life for something that I didn't do, mm. right? And I hear everything that you're saying, but what would make a person like me vote for you? Because honestly, and this is not an attack on you. You've said everything prim and proper, <laughs> but you haven't said anything that makes me trust you. I don't trust the judicial system. Mm -hmm. So question. what are you going to do for police reform? Because where I'm from, people are dying right now. Mm. And the police are scared to come to my neighborhood. Right. So there's no, uh, we're going to talk and all that uh, uh, mentorship. Mm. That never reaches my neighborhood. Okay. So why should my people even listen to you. All right, so you said a couple of things. First is, I don't trust the judicial system, all right? You're looking at me and I kind of look like you. And I've seen some of the same things you've seen. And me saying I want to be an attorney because I want to correct and I want to right certain wrongs. Hmm. I've been in courtrooms and I can talk about all my successes. I don't talk about my defeats too. Watching my defeats Oh, I say, okay, yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Evidence weighed all in your favor. How, come, how could it be that I'm now in a tough situation? That's why I recognize, like, I know what's happening, and let me step to the plate. Let me make sure the judicial system actually is the blind scales of justice that it purports to be. Let's hold it accountable to the to the promises that it said it was, right? Then you can actually infuse some trust. And that's what I'm saying, it's a huge ask, it's a huge lift. I'm saying I wanna do that. The other part is, and you said in your neighborhoods, there are people who are dying, right? Um, so I grew up the street from a nonprofit called Cease Fire, Don't Smoke the Brothers and Sisters. And I've embodied that. And I know that some things are beyond conversations. I know in the culture of certain neighborhoods, you know, it's beyond talking. Hmm. And you hope that we can create, and this is going forward, right? You hope that, and it may take some time, that you're implementing policies, you're implementing laws that create more opportunities so that this isn't the culture that we're in. And there are other ways. It's like we are who we, the music we listen to, the TV we watch, the video games we play. The, the people that are Don't say that, to my people. Look, that we're looking up to that we're looking up to in our neighborhoods. That's the wrong narrative. I mean, I'm I'm also open to listen. Well, if you say to me, point. if you say to me, look, this is the answer, or that's not the answer. Then I know not to try it. That's not the answer. Don't say TV music. Okay. Well, that that's a good point, you guys. We're gonna take a quick commercial break, and we'll come right back. <laughs> In America, I believe we've always been able to make things better. We create social change. Women obtain the right to vote. We made it possible for people to marry whoever they love. And we're going to end discrimination based on the color of your skin, religion, and place of origin. Because the law can do that. DC can become a more perfect place by ridding ourselves of the inequality that still exists. We can use the laws to uplift our communities and zealously advocate for the people to engineer a brighter future for all of us. My father worked for the Office of the People's Council, where he ensured DC residents had reliable, safe, and affordable access to utilities. My mom is a realtor who helps people navigate the process to gain access to housing, home ownership, and find their dream home. The devastating effects of 2020 are leaving far too many of us suffering. 
but now is the best time to focus on creating a brighter future. I'm Ryan Jones, and I'm running for Attorney General for the District of Columbia. I've been proud to fight for the individuals and the companies I've represented, protecting their rights. And I want to do that for all of D.C. It's time we protect and uplift the people. Being a native Washingtonian, I want the honor to fight to improve my hometown. I'll make sure all sections and neighborhoods are advocated for. Let's use today's technology to provide seamless access to justice by and through the Attorney General's office to give residents the immediate action they deserve. We must combat the injustices we continue to see. Together, with tireless effort and commitment, we can make the district and our country better. Welcome back, guys. We are going to continue the discussion that we were having on prison reform. Back to you, Ryan. Uh, yeah, so the question that was posed, uh, look, the Office of Attorney General has a split jurisdiction. A lot of the prosecutors for serious crimes that's found at the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, mm -hmm. and those are U.S. prosecutors. The Office of Attorney General in Washington, D.C. has a purview over, you know, juvenile and misdemeanors. However, you would hope that the influence of the Attorney General in Washington, D.C., you turn to the AUSA and say, mm -hmm. hey, look, this is what we think should happen here, and this is our recommendation. Here's how we need to handle this. Right. Right. Um, I think the, the question posed still is a very, you know, pointed one. Mm -hmm. How are you going to fix it? Yeah. And, and why should we trust you? And why should we trust you, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, uh, look, you prove it over time. You're just meeting me for the first time. I wouldn't trust anybody I met just, sure. mm -hmm. you know, right away. And not just that, you, you hear it all the time. So what's what makes you the exception? Yeah. You know, I think that's my greatest fear mm -hmm. in doing this is being able to honor and being able to do the large claims I'm saying I can do. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course. Um, but I've watched others try mm -hmm. and fail on the subject matter she's referring to. Mm -hmm. I want to try and succeed. And it's a unified effort. And it's going to require me to lean on a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Right. So you said prison reform. There's something I've touched on where I think residents in Washington, D.C., because of the jurisdiction, it's a, it's a federal jurisdiction. You can find yourself in prison in Oklahoma. Right. You're not going to get reform and rehabilitate there. Good point. Because you can't see your family. Mm -hmm. And now you're left alone on your own. And now you do things necessary to survive there. Mm -hmm. And now your term extends. Mm -hmm. So creating some humanity in the reform process is keeping people close to their family and loved ones. So if, if I'm in DC and I have to go visit my family member in Florida, I'm not going to get there. I got to get a flight. It's a long drive. Yeah. That's then a you huge don't, task. Now you feel like you're left alone. Mm -hmm. So if we can create a policy that keeps people within a three, four hour drive of Washington, DC, we might actually have some better uh, reform. See people actually that rehabilitate. Would be great. Right. That would be great. Um, those are the types of things we want to see. I know Council Member Robert White and Council Member McDuffie have proposed legislation that certain people who go to jail for certain uh, drug offenses, that they come back and they get jobs mm. now in this legalized drug industry. Mm. Right? We're watching marijuana become Legalize. legal. Mm -hmm. And people are sitting and rotting in prison for crimes that people are getting paid a lot of money for now. And the justice and that quality is saying, fixed. hey, when you come back, here's a job waiting for you. Same job you were doing, which was uh, being a merchant mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for a product. Right. So do it a certain way now. And hopefully you can feed and clothe yourself with that. Right. No, that's a great point. Did you have a follow on question? Did you have a follow on question? Next question. Yes. So question. Um, so the way we see the disparity between officers who um, arrest people of color, and that's an institutional issue, in the judicial system, do the prosecutors have the same mindset as p 
police officers the way they adjudicate crime? And if so, how can that be addressed or even discussed on among Look, the attorneys? So I think that's a, a very important thing. So the people who go to law school oftentimes aren't from the places that they're going to be prosecuting the people of, mm -hmm. right? And they don't have a connection to what's happening in those areas. Mm. And they go in there and it, it's not a human, it's not a, there's not a, a lot of uh, humanization in the process, right? I come from, you know, a person comes from, you know, the Midwest and they come to DC finding a job to prosecute. Their one job is to win, mm. right? That's what they want to do. They're not looking at the young man or young woman on the other side of the aisle from them in the courtroom thinking, Oh, you know what? I know your mom. I know your sisters or friends or your, and, and I need to try to address your matter with some compassion. They're looking at it like I got to get through this for my day and, and I got to move up the ranks in this office. And now you got a person pushed through the system just to get work off their plate, just so they get to the next thing. And you got to change that kind of a culture. And that's going to take a lot of effort and a, and a brave person to stand out there and do that and give alternate, an alternative to punishing in a certain way. So I appreciate that question. Great question. Next question. Um, so you, you briefly touched on, um, you know, folks trying to be rehabilitated and, and reformed and things like that. Um, but what, what programs would you be trying to champion for um, young black men returning from incarceration? Yeah, just touched on it. Uh, just laws that will get people jobs right and programs that get people jobs so that they don't have to resort back to the same thing that put them in prison mm. in the first place next question um so this city is pretty um multicultural and multifaceted um so we do have some residents that are of the senior citizen age we also have a lot of youngsters um could you try to try to touch on those a little bit, how you would help impact those those groups of folks? Yeah, absolutely. So two cases that I've had, one where I was representing a senior who would end up being taxed for, you know, and, and, and that would put her in a, a, a worse position financially mm. just based on how the code is interpreted. I want to stand up for those senior residents. I want to ensure that seniors, you know, before they're taken advantage of, and you know their savings are taken by people who are going after them and their properties are gone, we put them in a place that they're protected before the financial issue hits, right? Because once it hits, there's no getting it back. Mm. You know, you could put some, you could catch the perpetrator, but then the money's gone, the money's spent, the property's gone, right? So we gotta find another way to be creative to protect seniors. We have to protect our youth, right? Why, why, do, why is that necessary? Watched another case where, you know, we didn't hold the person who sexually assaulted these children to the standard that they were supposed to be held to. Why aren't we caring enough? How does that slip by? How does that standard get slipped or, or not met? Uh, so standing up against these people that make, because those type of things that happen to these young folks, it creates a rough development for them. And then they get uh, into certain, certain situations that mm -hmm. aren't positive for them because of what happened to them. So we need to hold folks accountable. And those are the types of things I want to do. Great answer. Next question. Um. What can you do to help us get cheaper parking on the streets of DC? <laughs> I don't that's think that's my I don't think that's my role. <laughs> that wouldn't be my role, but if there's legislation that would come up to do that, you know, I would certainly support it. Next question. Okay. Um What's your campaign statement yeah, uh, that you want to leave us with? Look, this is an opportunity to get equal access to justice. I want to ensure that all district residents 
have an equitable opportunity to thrive. And as an attorney general, I'll ensure that the laws that we put on the books uh, reach that result and reach that end. So thank you very much. Thank you guys for all of you guys that joined us via Facebook. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all of your questions. The other thing I forgot before we go, how do anyone who wants to donate to your campaign oh, yes. donate and how can they reach you? Please donate at uh, ryanjonesforag.com. You go there, there's a, a tab that says donate. It'll take you to a link. Or you can also write a check and mail it to the address that we have uh, listed in the website as well. You'll have to fill out a form. Please fill out the form, sign it. Uh, and also, if you may not be able to help financially, we need people. We need people to join the team. We have to get the word out. We have to put signs up. We have to put mailers out. We have to just spread the word about the good work that I think we can be do, that we can do, that I know we can do. Perfect. One last thing. What are your IG handles or your social media handles where people can reach out and follow so that they can see the amazing things that you're working on? Right. So Facebook, it's Ryan Jones for Attorney General. Um, Twitter is Ryan Jones for AG. Uh, my Instagram is just my Instagram. Okay. My initials RLJ, ESQ. Uh, that's my personal Instagram. I'm not doing a separate one for the campaign. Gotcha. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much again, Ryan. Okay, it's thank you. It's been a you. pleasure. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for continuing to support me. You guys have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>do you or anyone you know have a business or a brand you want to promote would you like to be a guest or be a part of our studio audience if so contact us at the shelly roy show at gmail.com or contact us on instagram at the shelly roy show can't wait to hear from you guys